SurfingAtLakesOne.com. Welcome to another episode of Around the Lakes. I'm Josh Durso, and today we are talking about the birds. Um, I guess this hour, Dennis Money and Chris Lejeski, uh, they are no strangers to the studio, as they pointed out before we came on here. Thank you both for coming in again. Thank you, Josh. Our pleasure. Uh, Dennis, obviously a huge, huge weekend uh, for you guys, just because of the landmark uh, that, that you got to. Uh, talk to us about what, what happened in the last few days. Well, on, on Saturday at the 12 o'clock tour, we had our 10,000th visitor since we started operations November 16th of 2017. And this was a young lady from New York City who was up, up in upstate New York visiting some friends from Bologna. And they chose to, us to come over, and they spent the, the night at the, bar, uh, the Barrister uh, B&B with Ken and Diane, <clears throat> and it was a great, um, great situation. They, we awarded them with some hats and some teachers, and <laughs> today I'm taking, picking up some photographs, and I'll be sending them uh, each a photograph of the event with our staff behind them. How does it feel to have to, to reach that number? That's a really, really big number. What, what does it feel like to finally hit that number and to, to know what you've been through and, and obviously what, what <clears throat> lies ahead? Well, I think what the significance is, is with very little advertising, so to speak, but with great media coverage, such as what we're doing here today, we've been blessed with people getting to know us, and especially in the Finger Lakes region. And uh, we're looking forward to the next 10,000 and more. We really think that we have a unique tourism attraction, found no place else in the world, and we're just getting the word out so people from all over the world will come and be able to enjoy what I've been enjoying for over 20 years. And of course, we're talking about the former Seneca Army Depot. Uh, now, obviously, uh, White Deer Tours, uh, there's a little bit of history incorporated into it, and now, birds. Chris, uh, talk to us a little bit about what that uh, partnership has been like. Um, obviously, early stages still, but uh, something that I'm sure you're uh, as an enthusiast and a, a pretty intense bird watcher, I believe. <laughs> yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> how does that feel? Well, the partnership between the Montezuma Audubon Center and the Seneca White Deer has been very strong uh, over the last several months. And Dennis and I have, have partnered together to promote these unique birding tours at the former Seneca Army Depot. And people are coming out, and it's wonderful. We weren't sure if it was going to take off. <laughs> but Dennis and I have, have been very pleased with the turnout. We've had over 60 people already come out for our tours just in the month of May, and we're only doing these on Monday mornings. Right. We have three more tours coming up in June. So it's a strong partnership. We look forward to expanding the relationship to do even more tours focused on <laughs> birds and other wildlife at this Audubon Important Bird Area. And, and what you sort of spoke to a little bit, uh, give us a little insight sort of into what – what makes the, the the bird tour aspect of it unique at the depot compared to other places where you might go on a bird tour? Sure. This is a unique habitat at the former Seneca Army Depot. It's what we consider a young forest. Okay. It was largely cut over during World War II era and Cold War era times, and now the habitat is growing up. And we have a lot of young trees. There are a few patches of more mature forest. There's some unique wetland habitats, streams uh, on the property as well. And so it's this unique mosaic of habitats <clears throat> in a very expansive area of 10,000 acres that brings in a, a great variety of birds. So far, we have had about 60 species of birds identified just on these three tours. We're looking forward to seeing what else is out there. What is the, and that's kind of the, the follow-up question is, what are the expectations? So obviously you probably had some idea what are the actual expectations when you when you set out to mm -hmm. take this kind of project on? Um, what are the expectations for the numbers of species you see? Is mm -hmm. that 60 number that you've recognized already greater than what the expectation was or is that actually sort of undercutting what it might be? It's the tip of the iceberg, we right. think. Uh, we think if, if we do a full year of tours, which Dennis and I are already talking about doing, certainly coming up for fall migration and even during the winter months, 
Uh, we expect well over 100 species of birds to be identified at the former Seneca Army Depot. Audubon got involved in this project actually back in the mid-90s when this was deemed an Audubon important bird area because of this young forest habitat that is starting to grow up, a unique uh, suite of birds can be found there, such as the eastern towhee, blue-winged warbler, American woodcock, um, field sparrow, uh, and, and just to name a few. So we have found all of those birds already uh, during these tours, and we think that with doing a full year, gosh, 100, 150 species is not out of the question. And for uh, as a tease for the, the non-birders out there who might just be interested in um, seeing some things that they might not see in their backyard. Uh, these species, are they, are they sort of unique to the area in that they sort of pass through at different times, or is this literally because of the habitat that is there, uh, these different species are present there at different times throughout the year? Different times during the year. We do, certainly do have a, a year-round presence of birds there on the property, but a lot of these birds that we've been seeing in May and now coming up into June are migratory species. These were birds that were at least down in the southeast United States for the winter months. Some, like the warbler species that we've been enjoying, uh, are down in Central and South America for the winter months. They may be, uh, like Baltimore Oriole, for example, they, they probably are going to nest right there on the former Seneca Army Depot. But, but some birds are just stopping, <coughs> resting, feeding, boosting up their reserves, and then going to head up to the boreal forest of Canada, which is another 500 to 1,000 miles north. Just a, just a short flight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what has been the reception so far, Dennis? Uh, obviously, from the, not only from those who have... Uh, been going on the tours, but also those who are planning tours and reaching out to you guys and actually talking to you about coordinating um, to to take these trips and to sort of see uh, what the depot has to offer. Well, I really think that the feedback has been extremely positive. Uh, people, uh, there's a mystique about what lies beyond the fence, but the, beyond that 24 mile fence that surrounds the old depot, and I think that's part of the of the reason that they came. Besides the birds, is to see the igloos and, and to see some of the personal bomb shelters and, and to learn about the history. So it's, it's a really good synergistic effect between what Chris provides and what I can provide with the wildlife and the history aspects of it all. I, th I think one of the more notable birds, though, is our long-term res eagle residents, mm -hmm. whom we now have named Seneca for the male and Cayuga for the female. They've been there for about 11 years. Last year they had two eaglets, this year they have one eaglet, and that's definitely a very popular spot on the birding tours. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we always talk about this when you come in, um, the history aspect is a huge, huge draw to the, the property itself. Um, how often do you sort of get that perspective where you're out there and maybe you're on a tour, maybe you're just walking out on the property, um, but you sort of stop and think to yourself, my God, 50 years ago this was... This was completely different, and and now here we are. Like, what what is that that what is that like um, when you are actually experiencing that maybe once a week or once every couple weeks, um, as opposed to somebody who just visits on a one off uh, weekend trip or something like that? Well, I I try to emphasize the fact that when the depot was built, it was built in le less than four months. And the place was a boom town, and people were living in squalid, squalid living conditions and tents and chicken coops even. And there was over 8,400 men and women working there, set, you know, 7 by 24. And I tried to emphasize that fact because it's so important that, you know, this place was alive. They had their own asphalt plant, their own concrete plant. They were putting in, you know, 24 miles of fence and 40 miles of railroads. And it was an incredible uh, opportunity here for the Finger Lakes region to come up with this unique arsenal that was going to be utilized as we went to war in, in Europe in World War II. And uh, I think it's a tribute to all the men and women who worked there. And we tried to emphasize that fact that uh, this was something that will probably never happen again in New York State. But it's there, and I think we need to recognize it and to appreciate it. And Chris, of course, as the, the wildlife expert in the room, I have to ask, um, is there a, a point that you try to drive home when you're, when you're talking about a property like the depot um, to remind people that very quickly nature 
takes its course and mm. can take back property and, and land and, and all these things that, that people have put their imprint on. And before you know it, different species of birds are coming back. You have animals that weren't there before. Is that sort of one of the points that you try to drive home to different folks when they're looking at this? The bald eagle nests that we stop at for every tour is that opportunity. Yeah. Many of the guests that we have on these tours remember a time when there were almost no bald eagles found in New York State. Yeah. We were down to our one last nesting pair of bald eagles down at the south end of Hemlock Lake in the Finger Lakes. And now they're thriving. They're found on just about every body of water. Certainly all the Finger Lakes have them, like Ontario, Montezuma as well. And this one active bald eagle nest at the former Seneca Army Depot is a great opportunity to talk about where we have been it, with our environment, what people did to bring our national bird to the brink of extinction, but also the opportunity that we all have to speak up for birds, for wildlife, for conservation. And, and, and now we can see this uh, bald eagle pair and the one eaglet that is thriving in the nest. And uh, it's really a, a testament to conservation, not only here in the Finger Lakes region, but across New York State and the country. And is it also an opportunity, we've talked about this before the last time you were on the show, um, is it an opportunity to talk to people about what conservation really is and how it isn't just sort of the act of letting something go and forgetting about it mm. and letting <laughs> nature take its course, but mm. rather um, being intentional about how it's treated and how it's uh, protected over the long term? And everyone has that opportunity to make a difference. Um, we may not all have 50,000 acres to manage like we have at the Montezuma Wetlands Complex or 10,000 acres at the former Senec Army Depot, but we all have a piece to, uh, uh, to play in this game. And um, it may be just be our backyard. It may be a schoolyard. It may be a local park. Uh, we could all make our world more bird friendly in some way putting out more uh, bird feeders, bird boxes, removing invasive plant species, uh, planting native vegetation that our native birds need to survive and thrive. So um, it's, it's an opportunity for people to, to make a difference. Uh, we, we all have choices in life. And uh, certainly the story that I tell when we visit the bald eagle nest really is inspiring. And um, it it's never gets old to see a bald eagle. Right. Now, uh, walk us through what a tour actually looks like. Um, if you guys could just sort of speak mm -hmm. to, somebody shows up, they're getting ready to go on a tour. How long does the tour last? What are some of the, the things that you encounter <laughs> throughout the tour? W walk us through what that tour experience really is um, and, and how it is for folks of all different ages. Mm. Yeah, so they're, they're approximately two and a half hour tours. They're advertised as being from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. However, there's so many opportunities to stop, get out of the bus, and enjoy the habitat and the birds and the bald eagles and the deer, of course. So we typically go to about 11.30 or so in the morning. Uh, Dennis provides a wonderful, comfortable bus. Uh, it's a 24-passenger, and we've been filling up that bus now. And they're serendipitous moments. You know, we have these plan stops. Uh, however, we may see that nice uh, herd of white deer at some place and, and want to stop and talk about why this is such an important area for the white deer and, and what that means. Um, but we provide binoculars, spotting scopes, field guides for our guests, and they're coming in from all over. We had people as far away as Erie, uh, Pennsylvania already, and Utica, New York. And you're filling the bus. Yes. That has to feel really good, um, given that y when you set out to do something like this, you know, you guys can both attest to this. You, you don't know how it's going to go. You don't know what the reception is going to be like. Um, but you fill the bus over and over and over again. That's got to feel pretty darn good uh, in terms of what you're setting out to accomplish, right? Well, you know, absolutely. My, my last name is Money. <laughs> and <laughs> we, both Chris and I have to pay the bills, and it's very encouraging to see <laughs> So many people coming from so many, so many places, not just locally, to experience the uniqueness of the depot. And 
Um, it's quite thrilling, and I have to say that sometimes I have to question Chris's ability to, to, know, to see the birds because last week he was pointing out in the sky that he was saying pterodactyl, pterodactyl, <laughs> and I'm saying, oh boy, if he starts seeing ar- <laughs> if he starts seeing uh, Archaeopteryx, then we're really in trouble. But <laughs> also <laughs> but, known as the Great Blue Heron, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we have a lot of fun, and, uh, and that's all part of it. And the people, you can tell the people really warm up to everything that we're talking to them about. It's a very friendly atmosphere, and uh, it's, it's just... And a, it doesn't sound like a dry, you're just sitting there listening to somebody talk for two and a half hours. It sounds like it's a it's a fun environment to be in. Is that really what you guys are focusing on doing to make sure that people aren't, you know, they aren't getting bored through the process or getting lost in sort of the, the uh, massiveness of the property mm-hmm. itself? It was great conversation on the bus, actually. Yeah. There were a lot of questions about the deer, about the history, the Cold War era, who lived there, uh, of course, the birds and other wildlife as well. So there's great conversation going on. Dennis provides all that cultural history. I'm talking about why these birds are coming through, the value as an important bird area there. Uh, We make three or four different stops along the tour as well, where everyone gets out of the bus to hear and see the birds experience the habitat. So it's not a dry, stagnant two and a half hours goes by just like that. Right. And you don't know what you're, you never know what you're going to see. You spot 60 unique species and you didn't set out to see those. Um, what's been the biggest uh, surprise so far, I guess, while you guys have been uh, going through these tours? Uh, was there any moment where you're like, huh, eh, I'm an expert, but I didn't really see that happening. Didn't, didn't expect it. Was, has there been any uh, moments like that so far throughout the process? The fir- very first tour, we had stopped at this red tile building, and I was telling them how this is a favorite roosting area, launching area for turkey vultures. And just as we say that, out of this hole in the wall of the building comes this turkey vulture just ripping through there, just scaring the heck out of us all. And that was just a unique situation right there. And for me, I think it has to be uh, showing people a bald eagle for the very first time. I'm, I'm still, with all the bald eagles that I see at Montezuma and across the Finger Lakes, I'm still a little surprised that people are seeing our national bird for the first time. And seeing that light bulb go off on, in people's heads and, and seeing excitement in their faces and pride and hearing the story behind the bald eagle and now being able to see a pair of adult eagles and an eagle in the nest, that has really uh, inspired me to and, and excites me to see what else are we going to see on these tours coming up in June. Mm-hmm. And Dennis, those tours in June, uh, how can folks get signed up to take them? Do they show up? What, what's the protocol for, for getting involved and to get out there? Well, there's two ways. One, you can call our, our phone, which is 315-759-8220, or you can go directly to SenecaWhiteDeer.org and sign up online. And our tours are next Monday, June 3rd, the 17th, and the 24th, and the last one will be the 24th. And as Chris said, they will go from 9 till about 11.30. And uh, we still have a few openings, but they're getting fewer and fewer. So don't delay. So act now. What, uh, what's the, the call to action? Obviously, looking beyond um, June, for, for you guys, what's the call to action in terms of uh, just getting out there and just getting to experience the depot, even if it's not for a bird tour, but just in general, the summer months have got to be an amazing time to get out there and just see everything at peak condition right right well every season has its nuances and you know now we're in the birthing stage of when the fawns are being born and uh we're starting to see some white fawns and some brown fawns and then gradually you're going to start to see the bucks start to grow the little antlers they're about four or five inches tall right now on many of the young bucks so so we had that spring scenario and then you get into the summer and and the deer will start to shed their winter coats and they'll put on their summer coats and uh, the antlers will start to get bigger and bigger, and the fawns will get bigger and bigger. And then, of course, the fall, we have the, the deer rubbing the velvet off their antlers, and the bucks are chasing the does. And then in the wintertime, the deer are naked. The leaves are off the trees, and you can see them from a long distance away. And it's really one of the best times of year to come out and experience them, because especially if, if you're a photographer. So every season has its... Has its uh, its benefits, and uh, I, that's why 
we've had people come back as many as five times already in less than 17 months. So that's a pretty good, pretty good uh, reputation. And, and of course, obviously out at Montezuma, um, seeing anything different or, or what's sort of being seen right now while I have you here, I have to ask, what are you guys okay. seeing out at Montezuma um, <clears throat> this time of year, the, mm. the June, early July range? Yeah, right now we're still right in the middle of the songbird migration. These birds that were overwintering Central and South America are still pushing northward here, especially with this extended cooler north wind pattern, weather pattern we've been in that's put a little bit of a delay in the bird migration. So they're still coming through. Great opportunities to see cerulean warbler and patronitary warbler, which are iconic bird species up in Montezuma. These are birds that typically are found in more of a southern region, at least down in the Appalachians, but more likely down in the oh, Alabama swamps and uh, Mississippi areas. So, But we have them up at Montezuma. So That's we're awesome. kind of in the northern and <clears throat> easternmost extent of its range. Of course, osprey and bald eagles are with chicks in their nests right now. A lot of activities around our marshes. The adults are grabbing fish out of these water bodies, bringing them back to the, the chicks that are uh, thriving and, and growing in those nests. A lot of birds still moving through, so it's a great opportunity to visit Montezuma right now. Very cool. And, uh, of course, Dennis, I got one last question for you. One of the ones that kept popping up on social media, uh, folks who want to get involved, folks who want to donate, folks who want to help you guys out, how can they get around to doing that? How, what's the, the best way to sort of connect with Seneca White Deer and figure out how they can uh, help you guys uh, get, get your mission and make your mission happen? Well, the best way is just to go to our website, SenecaWhiteDeer.org, and email us, and uh, you'll get a quick response. We can, we'll can we be glad to talk to you about any possibilities. All right, gentlemen, thanks for coming in. Appreciate the time. My pleasure. Thank you, Jeff.